There are a few things that any scientist needs. A lab coat, funding, and obviously a lab. However, because science is literally the most broad field, many scientists tend to specialize in only one small part. So when asked what they are, rather than saying, I'm a scientist, they'll say, I'm a physicist, or a chemist, etc. As such, the labs that go with each specialty vary wildly and come with very different requirements. For example, a physics lab will probably be filled with lasers and magnets and machines for letting you study the workings of the universe, whereas a chemistry lab will probably be full of glassware, fume hoods, and analytical equipment for making and testing compounds. Biology, though, is sort of a special case. Biology isn't like the other areas of science where you can stick to your little corner and normally be content. Biology is the result of millions of chemical interactions dictated by the rules of physics and quantified by mathematics that honestly makes me want to vomit. To be a good biologist, you really should have knowledge of all the other fields. And to make matters more difficult, there are so many different kinds of organisms, your lab will be further dictated by what sort of thing you want to work on. I've talked about it before, but moving between different types of organisms, or sometimes even species, is like switching between coding languages, only we didn't make up the code and have minimal understanding of what's going on or how the language works. So if you want to do genetic engineering, the first question is going to be, well, what sort of organism do you want to modify? If you want to work on, say, mammalian cells, then be prepared to shell out about, I don't know, 50 grand for all the hardware needed to keep those cells happy. But if you want to just work on bacteria and yeast, you can get away with far less. For the projects I want to work on, I'm content to work with bacteria and yeast, so my lab will be built to accommodate that. But the lab you'll see here can easily be modified to work with other sorts of organisms like plants very easily. This video will be the first of a several part series where I show how to build and stock a lab for genetic engineering work. In this part we'll go through the construction of the lab itself, and in future videos I'll take you through all the materials and equipment you need to do real lab work. And now that the lab is built, you'll see all sorts of projects come out of here, and I'll talk more about that at the end of the video. Since I have no intention of working with anything pathogenic or dangerous, the lab is built as a positive pressure room. All the air that enters first passes through a filtration unit that has a built-in carbon filter, HEPA filter, and UVC bulb to make sure that the air is nice and clean. This way the lab will stay dust-free and there'll be a lot less stuff floating around that could fall into a dish and contaminate things. And anything that leaves the room won't be any worse than what's already floating around in the very dusty workshop. Honestly, this is overkill, but because of how dusty the rest of the space is, it's necessary for my location. As always, the lab will be built in the Montreal hackerspace Foo Lab, so this meant clearing a space where we could build it. This took a bit of doing, since the shelves that were here were built by a bunch of hackers a decade ago. In case it wasn't clear, hackers are terrible carpenters, so this was not the simplest task. We had to clear out the table as well and the 3D printers they used to live here. And finally, we rehung the lights so that they were higher and wouldn't be resting on the lab's roof. With all that out of the way and a nice clear area to work, we could start on the build. The design is actually very simple. The room will be built out of a 2x4 frame that's 12 feet long and 7 feet wide. Then both sides of the frame will be covered with plastic and sealed well with construction tape. However, we aren't going to build this in the standard way that you would, say, frame a house. Because we need to affix plastic to both sides, we need flat surfaces to attach the plastic to. So where the corners of the walls meet, the beams are cut at 45 degree angles, and a 2x4 is sandwiched between them. After measuring out all the wood and cutting most things to length, we got started on making the two end walls. After cutting the ends off the top and bottom beams to have their 45 degree miters, I realized that I should probably trim them to length so that the miter is only as long as the 2x4 that'll sit in here, so that there aren't two pointy bits hanging at the back. So a second cut at about 30 degrees was made on the opposite direction. This was sort of sketchy to do on a chop saw, so use a better tool if you do this. Since the lab will be tucked away in a corner, we knew that we couldn't build it in its final position or we wouldn't be able to get the back two walls covered in plastic. So we cut the rest of the pieces for the longer walls, then assembled the frame with the intention of sliding it into place once some of the plastic was up. With the frame done, it was time for the very tedious process of adding all the plastic. We added the plastic to the back two walls and the roof, as all these areas would be inaccessible once the frame was in its final resting place. Plastic was cut to size, stapled into place, being sure to use little pieces of cardboard on top of the plastic to help spread out the force so the plastic won't rip. Then once everything was stapled, all the staples and seams were covered with strong construction tape. Also, be sure to gently tap in any staples that don't make it all the way into the wood with a rubber hammer before taping. Once that was done, the frame was slid into place, then screwed into the floor and back wall to add some much-needed support and rigidity. Before we can start work on the inside and finish off the outside walls, we need to do something about the floor. It was full of holes and we didn't want things coming up from below, so we got a floor epoxy kit and covered everything in a nice thick layer and let it cure overnight. The next day, once the floor was cured, we finished the outside plastic layer, but left a hole so that we could still get inside. Then we started on the inner layer of plastic, starting with the roof, but had to stop after only two walls were covered so that we could install the actual door. We built a frame out of some more wood, then stapled and taped the outside plastic to the frame before cutting a hole in the plastic for the door. 
With that done, the door could be hung, a doorknob hole was drilled out, and the doorknob and bracket set into place. To prevent air getting in around the door, some weather stripping was added snugly to the door frame so that when the door closes, it will seal nicely. One last touch before we finish putting up the plastic was to install these wooden boxes. They're designed to fit our air filtration unit, and I added an extra one in case we feel we need to add more airflow later. With those in the door installed, the remaining plastic could be hung on the outside, and the inside walls could be finished. In order to power everything inside the lab, we made a port out of a piece of PVC tube which was secured to the bottom corner with more tape, and then power cables could be fed through and sealed in place. Finally, the air filtration unit could be installed by cutting out a hole in the plastic, fitting in the unit, and filling the gaps with some spray foam. To prevent the whole room exploding like an overfilled balloon when we turn on the unit, we added an air exhaust which was made out of some larger PVC tube and capped with a paper filter. This will be replaced by a better carbon filter eventually. There's still a few things missing, but we'll cover those in future videos. The big one is a UVC bulb which will be used to occasionally sterilize the whole room, and drop down curtains on the outside to shield the rest of the hackerspace from the UV while it's running. But even then, it'll only be run while I'm the only one around, and I'll be in the other room for the duration of the run cycle. With that done, we loaded in a table, some shelves, and a fridge, followed by all the new equipment we'll need to do lab work. But we'll be going over all of that in future videos. Now, not all of our equipment will be purchased. Some things are just too expensive to have shipped to Canada, or just too hard to source, so instead we'll be building our own. Things like an incubator, PCR machine, heat block, and electrophoresis setup, all of which I'll show how to build. Now, the big question. How much did the whole room cost? Well, between everything including the air filter and all the building materials and epoxy, the cost was under 500 which I think is pretty great for the size of the room. The equipment that goes in here, though, that's where the major expense is going to be, but again, we'll be talking more about that in future videos. Fair warning, biology is expensive, so stocking a lab like this can still be very pricey, but it'll really depend what you want to do and how many projects you want to have running at once. Speaking of projects, you're probably wondering what I'll be using this lab for. Well, I have a lot of plans, but the first major project will be focused on making artificial spider silk. I recently ordered this vial of nightmare fuel, so our first big project will be extracting the DNA for Black Widow spider silk and getting it to run in yeast. But we won't stop there. We'll also be looking at biomineralization peptides and looking at some hardcore protein engineering. On contact with mineral solutions, these peptides pull them out of solution and form hard materials. Many of them actually come from creatures that have shells, so we'll essentially be making a strong version of shell that's made of the biological equivalent of Kevlar and concrete. In an upcoming video, I'll be taking you through the design process for the project, and we'll head out to the lab and start working through the process step by step and see if we can pull it off. And that's only the beginning, but I'll talk about other projects as we make progress on this one. Oh, and I'll be making the silk plasmids available once they're finished so that you can experiment with artificial silks as well. So, as always, be sure to subscribe and ring that bell to see when I post new videos. And if you like these videos and want to see more open source science, then consider heading over to my Patreon and becoming a supporter. Speaking of which, a huge thank you as always to my amazing patrons who help make these videos possible. That's all for now, and I'll see you next week.